So, um, welcome back everybody to our um, second session this afternoon. Uh, we've got one more paper and then we've got also some time to hear uh, a few different perspectives and ask some questions of a round table. So, um, I'm very pleased to uh, welcome our third speaker, Professor Paul Whitty from um, Oxford Brooks University, where he is a composer and a sonic artist. He's also a curator and organiser of the festival. And um, quite recently, he's become part of an HRC network that deals with composition that I think we'll hear a little bit about um, as well today. So please join me in welcoming you. Thank you. So I'll just start um, with a little bit of context. Um, thanks very much, Lauren. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm based in the School of Arts at Oxford Brookes University. Um, the School of Arts has really five fields. Um, they've been there for different lengths of time. Um, digital media, for example, has only just arrived, so we're still kind of working out how we can work with the digital media practitioners. Publishing arrived a couple of years ago. The core of the school originally was art and design, film studies and music. Um, and just for some context, there was a discussion of the REF, I know which is ubiquitous these days. So um, for REF 2014, we actually returned to four units of assessment. Some of our researchers in publishing studies, who are really book historians, um, returned with U of A 29, which is um, English studies. And then we also made returns to units of assessment 34, 35 and 36. 34 being art and design, 35 music and performing arts, 36 communication studies, library management and various other things, <laughs> which I can't remember now. Um, and in total, from our School of Arts, we, we submitted around 25 FTE of staff. And I think in total we have uh, somewhere in the 30s. So it was a relatively healthy percentage of our researchers. One of the things we want to work on um, for the next ref, depending on you know, what um, the expectations are from HEFKE, is seeing if we can increase the percentage of researchers that are returned um, to the next one. So what I'm going to talk a bit about today is a bit about interdisciplinary practice. Um, my practice, as Lauren mentioned, is as a composer. Originally I was a composer of notes, um, a composer who wrote a lot of notes down. I tried to create notes myself, um, pitches, events, musical events. Uh, I put them in particular structures um, and thought that was an interesting idea. Uh, I tended to get rather bored doing that, um, sitting at a desk with a large sheet of manuscript paper um, in the days before these kinds of things were uh, available on computer screens. And one of the things that I tended to find was that I had a lot of trouble making decisions. Um, there were ways of making decisions. I could set up a system which would help me make decisions about what I wanted to do. However, when I'd made the decision, I would look back and think, well, why exactly did I do that? And if, uh, to use the classic test, I was to explain that to my grandmother, uh, she would not have understood what I was talking about. And I thought that was a problem, really. Um, and so I started to think a lot about why I was doing what I was doing, why I was using the material I was using, and started to think that was, there was maybe enough material already in the world, and I should try to interact with that material, things that already existed, um, be they places, locations, musical scores, instruments, sound-making objects, devices, and so on, uh, rather than perpetually trying to invent my own way or my own language um, for dealing with musical material. And so one of the things I also did was work, begin to work a lot with practitioners from other disciplines. I felt I could learn a lot. My musical education led me to think that really as a composer, my job was to tell everyone else involved in the situation what they should be doing. And not only that, but I felt that it was my job to tell them the right thing to do. And it was possible for me to tell them the wrong thing to do. And if I did that, the piece wouldn't work. I think that was a mistake, looking back on it now. Um, and so in my early years of my PhD, I spent a lot of time thinking I should tell people what to do and how to do it. And then towards the end of the PhD, I realised it was much more interesting to listen to other people uh, talking to me about what they'd like to do and what they could do and how I could interact with their um, abilities and so on. And so I started to work a lot more with practitioners from other disciplines, from dance, um, from fine art, but also with other composers. I started to improvise more um, and to make things up as I went along, rather than thinking I had to decide what I was going to do before I started. Um, the title of my talk is Exhausted by Place, or Places Are Not Easily Exhausted. This refers to um, a couple of works I've been working on recently, and which are ideas about what we find in a particular location in terms of sound materials or sound behaviour, and what maybe we can do with those things. The notion itself comes from um, some writing by Georges Perec, who I'll mention later on, 
um, who tended to observe places usually from a seat in a cafe and try to write down absolutely everything that he saw or experienced. So one of the things when I was trying to expand the field of what I was interested in, in terms of my practice, one of the things I became particularly interested in was our perception of sound and how we discuss sound. So not just composition in terms of sounds invented on a sheet of manuscript paper, realized by performers or through electronic means, and then distributed via a concert or through loudspeakers, but actually sound as we experience it every day. So one thing that I found when reading Process the Captive was this particular paragraph, which I thought was particularly interesting because it tells us something about sound and how sound informs our daily experience. At daybreak, my face still turned to the wall and before I had seen above the big window curtains what tone the first streaks of light assumed, I could already tell what the weather was like. The first sounds from the street had told me, according to whether they came to my ears deadened and distorted by the moisture of the atmosphere or quivering like arrows in the resonant, empty expanses of a spacious, frosty, pure morning. As soon as I hear the rumble of the first tram car, I could tell whether it was sodden with rain or setting forth into the blue. So this was the beginning of a, a kind of engagement with sound in its broader sense, in its contextual sense, cultural sense, as well as sound as an artefact within musical composition. Um, here's a hand-drawn map of Vauxhall Cross um, in South London. Uh, this was drawn by an artist, Anna Best, who I was working with. Um, we decided we'd like to explore this place, Vauxhall Cross, and we'd explore the sonic history of the place. Uh, Vauxhall Cross, if you know it, it's a large traffic gyratory near the MI5 building. Um, recently been very much refurbished in terms of the transport networks there. And when we explored this, it was um, in the early 2000s. Um, it was a slightly more chaotic space. We were interested in the fact that in previous times, in the 18th century, this had been the site of the Vauxhall Pleasure Gardens. So we were interested in looking at the um, changes in the kind of sonic environment, the audio environment, if you like, in this space, or auditory environment. We thought a lot about um, how sound was organised in the place. We thought a lot about how sound was organised perhaps in the works of Thomas Arne, who was a composer in residence there in the 18th century, and how now the sound seemed to be organised by the sequence of traffic lights and how that affected the way we heard the internal combustion engine as its stock started and so on. Um, the red marks uh, indicate the traffic lights on the system. I think there were 39 in all. So we made a film about this. We took some singers down to the space. We um, recreated uh, some songs by Thomas Arne, uh, which he composed specifically for the site. We took them there. We asked the singers to sing these songs. Uh, and they did that with, in combination with the traffic lights. The sequence of the traffic lights tended to um, direct what they were doing, what their activities were. And the idea was to uncover what would happen if we tried to take back a previous sonic strata, this strata of um, 18th century song, back to the present site um, and see how that interacted. One of the things we found is a lot of people who passed us by as we were singing presumed we were protesting about something. So we started thinking a lot about that combination, that kind of relationship between protest and song and, and public event. Now, obviously, one of the things that I did, being a composer who tended to like notes, was I, I went to the British Library and I investigated um, works by Thomas Arne, which he'd written specifically for performance um, at the Vauxhall Pleasure Gardens. Um, this is a cantata called The Morning, cantata number five, from quite a big collection of cantatas. And one of the things we really liked about this one in particular was the text. Um, the glittering sun begins to rise on yonder hill and paints the skies, is the opening line. And we felt that contrasted very clearly with the kind of really chaotic, difficult urban environment that had been created around Vauxhall Cross. Bearing in mind that, of course, in the 18th century, it was also an urban environment, but there was an idea of bringing the pastoral back to this environment through these songs and cantatas. So one of the things I started to do and started to think about is, uh, I mentioned beforehand that I was interested in uh, musical objects, in notes, in trying to organize myself and dealing with how to, how to make uh, choices about what I used. I mentioned then that I'd started to think about using notes and the musical events and objects that already existed and reorganizing them. And this was one of the first occasions that I did this. Um, I tended to read quite a lot in those days, um, and one of the short stories I read, it was a short story by Borges, um, in which he discussed um, a literary analysis um, of Don Quixote, which instead of dealing with qualitative aspects of the text, dealt with, dealt with quantitative aspects of the text. So the literary analysis was actually a list of all of the words in the text 
organised so that you know how many times each word happens in the text. And I thought, well, this is a really interesting way of reorganising things. It's a bit like, um, I don't know about you, but uh, whenever I'm involved in any building work, which isn't very often, I do very much like going to the builder's yard and seeing the bricks, but I'm very generally not very pleased with the result after the bricks have been put into a building. So I like the objects themselves, but I don't necessarily like the context in which they end up. So in this case, I thought, well, what I would try to do is suggest to the performers performing the work a misreading or misunderstanding of the text. So what I asked them to do, instead of reading from left to right, um, as you would normally do, and instead of playing the piece at the same tempo, I asked them to read their line, but start with the highest pitch in the line and play that one pitch on its own as a single event. And then if that pitch happens again in the line, play it again. So however many times that happens, keep playing that pitch. And then move down to the next one, then the next one, then the next one. So instead of getting um, this song, which moves from left to right in this narrative way, we get, in effect, a collection of pitches, a collection of notes. So I'll just um, play you a short extract of that so you get some idea of um, how that sounds. So it's a reorganisation of the materials, of arms materials. Um, there are certain things that the musicians are asked to do. They're asked to keep uh, their interpretation of each of the pitches pretty much as it is when they would play it in the score. Um, but of course the result, the sounding result, is completely different. So let's move on. This is a B flat. Um, this B flat comes from Caesar Franck's Violin and Piano Sonata in A major. Uh, it's from the first movement, bar 60, beat 1. One of the things I started doing when I started exploring this idea of individual moments from, from scores or using what I would describe using scores as a geographical place and actually trying to navigate my way through this score. So rather than thinking that there was only one path and the only path I could take was starting in the top left and working down to the bottom right, uh, I started to think, well, there are myriad paths I could take through these scores. So I started to take them apart bit by bit. This was a complete uh, blind alley, by the way. What I decided to do was write down all the pitches that were in the piece, and I soon discovered after several weeks of doing this that this was not a very good idea. Well, it might be a very good idea, but it was going to take me months. So then I started to think a little bit more, and this is when I also come back to thinking a little bit about my relationship with the other, kind of before, the other people involved in the process of composing. I started to think that actually it's very, very important to interact in a proper, in a human way, with performers, not to think of them as someone who's going to, who has particular skills, who's going to do a particular thing um, to the benefit of your composition, but someone who actually is an equal participant in the creative moment. Um, and so I started to discuss these ideas with a group of performers, and it seemed that by far the best way to do it was to actually use the cognitive abilities of the performers to perform this task, rather than me spending, maybe it could have been up to a year, uh, creating this piece of music which would have lasted about 20 minutes. Um, in ref terms, that would have been, you know, reasonable, but, you know, uh, not necessarily perfect in terms of what I was looking for. So uh, I decided that it would be much quicker and much more effective and much more exploratory and more interesting to actually work with performers. Um, and believe me, in those days, that was a bit of a shock for me. Um, OK, so going on a little bit, I mentioned George Perrick a little bit earlier on. And the idea that I became interested through this project, Vauxhall Pleasure, um, which was the project that we um, took part in at Vauxhall Cross, through the development of that idea, I became more and more interested in not just the sounds of composition, but in everyday sounds. And I became very interested in the idea of the composer or sound artist 
or you know, uh, someone who's interested in sound, kind of being interested in sound from all um, aspects of life, being interested in quotidian sound, getting away from the kind of hierarchy um, of sounds, which we are, tend to be trapped by, I suppose, as composers sometimes. So here's a little bit uh, from uh, Perec, which I'll just read. The street, try to describe the street, what it's made up of, what it's used for. The people in the street, the cars, what sort of cars, the buildings, note that they're on the comfortable, well-heeled side. Distinguish residential from official buildings. The shops, what do they sell in the shops? There are no food shops. Ah, yes, there's a baker's. Ask yourself where the locals do their shopping. The cafes, how many cafes are there? One, two, three, four. Why did you choose this one? Because you know it, because it's in the sun, because it sells cigarettes. The other shops, antique shops, clothes, hi-fi, etc. Don't say, don't write, etc. Make an effort to exhaust the subject. Even if that seems grotesque or pointless or stupid, you still haven't looked at anything. You've merely picked out what you've long ago picked out. So this is all about um, having an obsession with what is in a particular place, being able to spend time in a particular location and explore it in all its detail. In this particular text from Species of Spaces, George Perrett goes on to talk about what he might imagine happens in that space, thinking about what's beneath his feet, thinking about what might happen if King Kong were to appear, uh, and so on, or if grass was to grow uh, in the centre of Paris. So I started to think about places that I could exhaust. And I started in my uh, kitchen. Uh, I live in a different house with a different kitchen now, but this was my kitchen a few years ago. And one of the things I started to think about in great detail was the sonic or auditory life of the objects in my kitchen. I made a list of the objects on one shelf, which obviously clearly expresses the notion that I have way too many objects in my house. Um, this was the contents of one shelf. I won't read that for you. You can have a look if you like. There were lots of bits and pieces from all over the place. And one of the things I started trying to do was investigate each of those objects and think, well, OK, well, what materials is, is this made of? Where exactly has it come from? So, for example, uh, I think I spent quite a lot of time. Let me see if I can find the right object here. Um, let me have a look. What have we got? Sue Ryder Shop in Reading. No, it's not that one. Um, OK. Mm, can't find it at the moment. Well, there was one object. Oh, here we are, yeah. All Achille, glazed earthenware container made in China and bought in America. One of the things I started thinking about this is how far have the materials in this object travelled? What can I gain from trying to understand the sonic life of these objects? What about the constituent materials that made up this object, the clay? Where did the clay come from? Where was it mined? How did it reach manufacture? When it reached manufacture, where exactly was it made? It appears to have been made in China, but then clearly taken to America. What kind of places would it have passed through? Um, in, the, in the time between, it arrived in America, I bought it, I took it back in a plane over to England. And it started to reveal to me the absurdity of our culture, that I had these objects made in China, bought in America, taken back to England, in my kitchen, somewhere near Reading. It seemed insane. Um, and so, Starting out with an idea about sound, with an idea about the sonic history of the objects in my kitchen, starting with Perrick's idea about close observation and trying to exhaust a place, I ended up thinking about um, the way that we create objects, our material culture. So in a way, one of the things that I think is very important in um, research practice is uh, not to limit yourself. Now, I wouldn't say that to my PhD students, because with my PhD students, I tend to give them about six months uh, to think about all the myriad wide things their project could relate to and then say to them, right, now then, we've got to work out whether this PhD project is something that's going to take you 30 years or whether it's going to take you two weeks. And what we need it to do is take about three years. Okay, so we've got to find the right kind of focus here. Um, but one of the things that I tend to like to do with these kind of projects, which is maybe a little bit how I like to ask my PhD students to work in the first six months of their PhD, is just expand the territory, keep thinking, keep pushing outwards, because you never know what you might find. Um, uh, yes, more of that. Okay. Oh yes, the other place I decided to explore um, were, was a cafe in Oxford. Okay. Um, it's not there anymore, which is a terrible tragedy. Um, but it, it used to be there, and it had a refrigerator in it. One of the things that I do not like about cafes, although do like, because I talk about it a lot, um, is refrigerators. Refrigerators are amazing things. At Oxford Brookes University, we have a, a large atrium in our new building. Um, it's been designed, designed very, very carefully. 
but the refrigerator in that building resonates throughout the whole space, almost as if the whole resonance space was created for that refrigerator. A bit like the idea that, you know, the Gabriellis may have thought that St Mark's had been created just for this amazing music that they were going to create. I think our, our Oxford Brooks Forum was created precisely um, to deal with the refrigerator in Starbucks because it amplifies it and it's very exciting. So one of the things I decided to do with these was to think again, try to think creatively, what can I do about thinking about these spaces um, which are dominated by certain sounds, by these quotidian sounds. And as I'd said before, I became very interested in trying to transfer creativity to other performers, to other people involved in a process. So instead of writing scores with lots of notes in, I tend to write instruction scores. So I started to create a series of slightly facetious instruction scores um, around my experiences of the sonic life of Oxford. And here is one. This is one version of it. Composition for a refrigerator number one. First, find out where the refrigerator was manufactured. Two, calculate the distance between the current location of the refrigerator and the place in which it was manufactured. Three, walk from the current location of the refrigerator to the place of manufacture and lay cables as you walk. Four, when you arrive at the location of manufacture, procure a loudspeaker and plug the cable into it. Five, before setting off on your journey, you may like to make a phone call to the manufacturer, place the phone receiver next to the refrigeration unit, and ask them whether they recognize the sound of the refrigerator and whether it belongs to them. Six, alternatively make a recording of the refrigerator and post the email or drive it to the place of manufacture, suggesting that the recipient plays it loudly. So this is the idea that um, in the same way that dealing with the objects in the kitchen, the idea that every kind of object that makes a sound or has sound latent within it um, has this kind of history. So the idea that do the manufacturers of this object have any idea that in this particular context um, it creates a certain effect? And I'm sure they don't model it in that way. Um, so the next thing I started to do was work with a particular place. Working with Perek's idea um, of trying to exhaust the place, I had this notion, which as it turns out was entirely misplaced, but you don't necessarily need to know that now, but I've just told you, that I could exhaust the place. I could spend time somewhere and investigate it to such an extent that I would be an expert on that place. I would know everything about the sonic life of that place. Uh, what I did is I chose a field in Devon. I chose a field in Devon because I, I, I knew a farmer in Devon who had a field, which was an interesting field. And I decided that I would spend time in that field investigating it sonically. And one of the things I started to try to do was think about, well, can I record the sounds in this place? Um, a lot of my PhD students and myself work with field recordings, recording quotidian sounds, um, recording urban soundscapes, rural soundscapes, and so on. And one of the things I came up against very quickly, which is one of the fantastic things about research when you really start to explore it, is the total inadequacy of my methodology. And not only was my methodology inadequate, my equipment was inadequate, um, and really actually, you know, physically I, I was inadequate. I needed to be there the whole time in order to deal with this project, and I couldn't be. It's in Devon. Why I didn't choose a field near Oxford or Reading, I don't know, but I did choose this field. I visited it once a week for six months, which was, pretty good going, uh, but realised I really needed to live there, not, and not just for a year, maybe for many years, uh, to really get to know it. So it was an idea, uh, it didn't really work. Uh, but one of the things I did while I was down there, and I'm still going there occasionally, with slightly, uh, slightly reined in my expectations of what I'm going to achieve in this field, one of the things I started to do was to work with um, musicians and take them to the field and ask them to interact with, to filter, to explore the soundscape in the field with using their instruments or other sound making devices. This relates a little bit to the ideas that I discussed around scores, thinking about a score as a place, finding a route through the score, encouraging musicians and myself to find those routes and to realize the score in a different way. In the same way, the field works a little bit like this. So one of the things I did was work quite a lot with a violin player called Emma Welton, who's there in some very long grass in a very low res um, photo. And I asked her to think about the sounds that she was hearing and then use her instrument to filter those sounds. So I'll just play a very brief um, example of that process. <laughs> 
So most of the air conditioning joined in briefly there. Um, so what, what we end up with through this process is something that I wouldn't necessarily have recognized at all as musical composition when I started on my kind of research journey, but it's something which is an interaction with a space. It's a series of sounds that actually are very much located in a particular place and the interactions and activities of a musician in that particular place. Um, so they really are located in that way. Um, one final example, or probably I should stop there, do you think? Just, no, one final example, um, thinking about this in the same way, so kind of working with musicians um, to explore a space, kind of handing kind of creative agency back to them. Um, the final example was a, a piece I worked on with a group called Music We'd Like to Hear, um, which took place last July. And this is the score. And really, it's a bit like a scored version um, of the previous work that I did with Emma Welton, which I've just played you. So, performers may participate in one or more of the activities listed below. Number one, attend to the sounds of the environment in which you are situated. Use any sound-making device or devices to respond to what you hear. Consider the sound that you hear to constitute an audio score. Do not attend to the activities of any other members of your ensemble. Two, visit the site of the performance prior to the performance. Perform one of the following activities. Number one, write a list of everything that you hear. Use this list as a text score during the performance of this work. Number two, make a mental note of everything that you hear. Use this mental note to direct your activities during the performance of the work. Three, make an audio recording of the environment. Replay this and respond to what you hear during the performance of the work. You may choose to replay it on a device with headphones or loudspeakers. Three, walk away from the venue on the day of the performance in any direction and perform one of the following activities. Those activities are the same as the ones um, which are designed for performers if they visit the site um, before the activity. Activity one and the materials resulting from activities 2.1 and 2.3 and 3.1 to 3.3 may be performed continuously or discontinuously and in any combination during the performance. The performance may be of any duration. So in this case, um, there is a lot of freedom given to the performers. This in itself is nothing new. But in terms of the development of the actual material, there is a sense that you are responding to what you hear in the place. You are trying not to attend to the activities of the other performers in the space, but you are attending to, in particular, the sound of that one space. So it really is connected to this idea that as composers, as musicians, we are primarily listeners, and we are primarily in a sounding environment, and we have to decide how we deal with that. And as I said very early on, I decided that dealing with it through creating a kind of um, hermetically sealed world of the musical work or compos composition and presenting that in performance wasn't for me the most interesting way of proceeding. Um, so finally, just to say, one of the things that I do in the School of Arts at Oxford Brooks is I am the research lead for the school. And when I'm working with researchers, um, I, I would say, actually, it's probably worth saying that we have around 50% of our researchers are practice-based and 50% are text-based. We have a massive range in terms of research typology from musicologists who, um, for example, re might require funding to go to the British Library or require funding to go to an archive in Harvard or somewhere like that, um, to practitioners who require funding to build objects or to hire space. Um, and those kinds of things. So we have a lot of challenges in terms of working with um, text-based research all the way through to um, practice-based research, some of which results in very large-scale kind of sound art installations, others result in recordings um, or texts, creative texts and so on. So it is a very challenging environment to be in um, and we are in the School of uh, Technology Design and Environment which is dominated really by architectural technologists who are used to dealing with carbon counting, um, looking at the construction of buildings, not from an aesthetic viewpoint, but from a functional viewpoint. So there are lots of discussions to be had about the importance of this kind of research. The key way that I have found for um, dealing with that um, particular situation, I won't call it a problem, but situation, is to encourage the researchers in our school to group together. One of the things you often find in REF environment statements is these kind of uh, endless acronyms of research groups, different types of research groups, which might be a little bit frustrating for people. But actually, if it's a real grouping of people, even if it's only two or three, who put on a single event every year exploring their practice, then it's worth doing. 
because it sends a signal to the university, to the faculty, um, and out into the kind of world of kind of practice beyond the institution that you are serious about what you do. Um, and I think for us in our School of Arts, when we started dealing with practice-based research and realised that it was important um, in terms of the REF and other research assessment exercises, um, that was our key strategy to group together and work together in those areas. Thank you. Done lots of thoughts, so I tried to put them into a coherent order. But um, please bear with me if this doesn't come across maybe as coherent as uh, the other presentations that we've heard have been. Um, I think it was really great actually to end with that and um, really perhaps put some of the ideas that we've heard into context by looking um, at a research project in its um, development and genesis. And I think it's quite interesting to hear about this research because just before. Um, Paul started to speak, I thought about the traditional place that perhaps music and composers have had in the academy, and that has been perhaps a different journey to theatre researchers, filmmakers, um, etc., because um, music as a discipline has had a long history in the academy, and composers have shared that history. So in the sort of 1970s and 1980s, it wouldn't have been that strange to find a composer in residence in a university, whereas perhaps a script writer in ev evidence, uh, a costume maker in uh, residence, a filmmaker in residence might have been slightly different. So for composers, the idea of practice research has been an idea of a change in their possible role in the academy as opposed to an entry into the academy. And I think this has been perhaps a difficult narrative for some composers to deal with. So I thought that it was interesting that Paul spoke about how the traditional conception of the composer as the kind of authoritarian uh, dictator of the ensemble um, was ultimately quite limiting to his research goals, um, and which led him really to consider the materialism of uh, sound and music and that's relationship with composition. Um, and it was interesting how he, to me, how he spoke about that as being kind of interdisciplinary and interartistic, and you presented literary quotations to, um, to uh, explain your practice. And I think we also saw this in Eric's uh, talk. Were they your photographs that we saw in yes, your slides? Were, yes. So, you know, we had the undercurrent of your research um, there as well. And I, so I think it's really interesting to see how, actually, even if we think about sound as an abstract concept, in your presentation of it, it doesn't sit in a vacuum and it is informed by all of these other artistic concepts. Um, so, you know, the idea that sound has a musical dimension, music has a sonic dimension, but they're perhaps further dimensions of a, a kind of artistic way of thinking is a really helpful way of presenting things. Um, and similarly, the idea that time and space may have quite a lot of parallels between um, each other. So. Um, this is an idea that I personally am quite interested in, that the kind of spatial dimension of something and the, the temporal dimension of something might not actually be that different from each other. And one problem that's raised about music is often, well, music exists in time compared with a statue which you can come back to look at. But actually, I think that was a very good argument of how space and time can be considered um, similarly to each other. And um, the example of the Vauxhall Cross piece with the link with the past, um, was probably a very good example of that for me, that, okay, music is ephemeral and the sound of Thomas Arne is essentially uh, inaccessible to us. Um, and similarly, the sound of your piece when you performed it is inaccessible to us. But the idea of sound having a past and a future life is communicated very clearly through that piece. So although the performance has passed, the knowledge claims have not passed. And I think that that was a really good example of that. Um, so I also was very interested that you were willing to talk to us about failure in your research, particularly in the Frank and also your problem with the field, um, because in practice research, we never publish negative results. We never show work that doesn't work. We never perform things that have gone wrong. And actually, in other disciplines, that would be expected of us. 
Um, and so I think there is a discussion to be had there around things that don't work and things that went wrong. Um, I will now never attempt to catalogue all of those notes, <laughs> and uh, Frank nor will I try to live in a field. Um, and so, arguably, I've learned something there this afternoon. But perhaps on a, on a more serious note, the idea that the process of investigation is central to the research means that even when it didn't yield the piece that Paul thought it would, it does, you know, c um, contribute to the research narrative that was created across those pieces. And I think what really stood out for me was how the presentation of that journey caused you to present at the end some criteria for you, um, which were for your research, but also for your understanding of music. And um, so where you talked about the interaction with space and musicians is what creates music. And I think that's a really useful example of how, you know, the idea of music being the... Uh, white man with a stick conducting the musicians in the concert hall is really quite removed from the pieces that you showed us but that that has been reached through this process of research and through locating sound in everyday life and so the research journey that we've seen there um, gave a definition to process to sound to research and ultimately to music and one that came from the process of practice so personally I found that very helpful to see the research laid out that way. And I think um, without wanting to kind of come back to REF really with a much emphasis, that to me, that narrative is something that perhaps we might think about in the idea of documentation and of communication, because I think it's something, I think that that was an excellent example of opening the box as Rachel was talking about, the idea that we can see the whole process of the research and we can see how it is embodied in the products, but also how there is a kind of replicable methodology there which could be applicable across disciplines and to composers of other types of music. So um, I think it's really um, helpful and productive to share these examples um, for those reasons. So um, that's all the things that I wanted to say, and uh, thank you to Paul. I think we have time for a couple of questions before we move on to the next section. So. Are there any, or should I? If I let's clap uh, first. <laughs> 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 uh, I had a question about exhaustion. Mm -hmm. um, I was really interested in the idea that a place might be, or a subject might be exhausted, because it sounds to me like actually the space exhausted you. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I was thinking about. Which made me wonder about that term, exhausted. Like, it sounds like something you don't want to do to a thing, like exhaust it. Um, and what it might mean to exhaust something. And also, I was kind of thinking about like my own kind of attempts to catalogue um, and to observe a lot about space. And that actually, what ends up happening isn't an exhaustion of the subject, but a proliferation of subjects. And suddenly I realised I need to be an expert in about like six different fields just to write like a pamphlet. <laughs> um, which made me think um, of the poet Charles Olson who had a similar idea to Perk, I think, in that but he he talked about it in terms of like knowing or becoming an expert in one thing. And his thing was his hometown. He lived in that space for a really long time. He kind of felt that in order to be able to know this one subject, he needed to know a lot of other things also in order to sort of know Gloucester, which is where he lived, which would then give him an access into other things. He also needed to know, you know, everything about kind of like um, whaling that had ever happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was, I was just interested in what you understood by e exhaustion, really. Well, I think in terms of Perek, I saw it certainly initially as a very positive thing. Mm. You know, it's this idea that instead of simply you know, passing by the everyday objects and activities of life, you actually spend a lot of time investigating them. Um, and then he, in, in his Species of Spaces, goes on to imagine additional worlds happening within this world that he sees or experiences. Um, I don't actually think that's necessary. I think he probably didn't spend it long enough sitting at the cat kind of looking at what was there. Because what I found, obviously, when I went to the field, it's a very different type of space. But um, as you say, it was a proliferation mm. of 
issues. So I realized I had to know a lot about the history of that space. There are lots of abandoned or dry riverbeds there. So in order to understand how they had developed, I would need to know how that river had mapped itself across that landscape, not just for the last 200 years, but actually since that valley was formed where I was working. Um, and so it's kind of fascinating, but daunting at the same time. But I think that idea of trying to exhaust a place is quite, in terms of an imperative for the researcher, it can be quite a positive thing. But I think that I was just rather too excited when I took on that project and thought, yeah, I can do it. <laughs> You know, yeah. and of course that's it's not possible. You know, yeah. it's an impossibility. But that's you know that's that's the beauty of it. I think. But he's also kind of thinking that if you really exhausted something in itself, it would not be a failure, but it would be related to failure. In a way. <coughs> yeah, I mean, so, you start to have to exhausted and emptied out in a way. Yeah, yeah. Potentially, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I wanted to pick up on that idea of um, exhaustion and looking at the, the idea of place as a body. Um, because I've heard about um, composers uh, sort of saying that the reason that they retire is because they feel there's no more music left in them. Um, and I know this, this came up in uh, Michael Caine's performance in Youth film recently. So I just wondered, in terms of sort of lived experience, how the idea of um, failure um, would come into the idea of retiring for a composer if there is no more music left in you? How, how would you respond to that? Well, <laughs> well I think for me, I, I kind of, <laughs> maybe there was no more music left in me when I was about 23. And so <laughs> I started looking for music <laughs> elsewhere, you know. Um, so most of my practice has been based on borrowing materials from other places, it's, which is not to say that that's the music, because then you go on to make you know, objects from that. And it's a bit like a process of building. There are lots of raw materials or not all refined materials, in fact, that can take apart and put back together again. And I think the idea of um, what you're suggesting is, is based more on a, a notion of the composer as someone for whom the, the material wells up from inside. And if that, that dries up, then whatever that might be, that idea of inspiration, or you know, um, it's hard to continue. But also, in, in that kind of world of the, the kind of you know, professional composer or the concert book composer, failure is a massive issue. So, you know, if you, the, the, I, when I was uh, younger, I read a lot of biographies of composers, English composers, probably the earlier 20th century, and they all seemed to have terrible problems with, you know, um, writer's block, or with getting to a stage where they felt that one work which they'd written maybe 15 years previously was the work, and that after that it had all been downhill. But that model of a composer is kind of problematic, I think, really. It, seem, it seems very... Um, uh, it does seem really archaic, but it also seems um, not to, they're not really, it seems very centred on themselves as a creative agent, rather than looking outside of themselves to kind of um, explore the kind of creative um, abundance. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that. That was wonderful. Um, very interesting. I just wanted to ask you, I guess, two questions. One is um, the adoption of a methodology with Again, going back to this exhaustion thing, so um, exhausting the properties of a place in a way, um, it, it seems like an obviously pointless exercise, and I wondered whether the pointlessness of it was the point of it, if you know what I mean. In other words, were you in some way kind of critiquing some positivist cataloging, uh, you know, methodology that knowingly, or was it, um, well, I mean, my experience of composition and composition training is that it ha it's, it's very much based on a sort of pseudo-scientific analysis of, of something and uh, I wondered whether that was a hangover from that sort of way of thinking in your training or whether you see it as a, actually a creative strategy to sort of get yourself to a point of personal exhaustion of you know, giving up almost. I, I think that there's anecdotally the moment at which I realised that I didn't want to go on creating my own material, much such as it was my own, um, was I was thinking the third year of my PhD, I was creating a large work based on Schoenberg's Chamber Symphony of this one. And in those days, what well, I would not have let that the moments from that piece be themselves. So I transformed the material. I was still using found material, but was transforming it. And I'd spent several weeks working on this transformation of all the pitch materials um, in two of the parts, and realized to my horror that I had made a mistake uh, maybe, you know, 9,000 pitches earlier, um, and then started thinking about, well, what am I going to do about that mistake? Because number one, 
absolutely no one would be aware that I've made that mistake except for myself. Um, secondly, how has that mistake actually changed the end, ending, the sounding result of this work? Um, and those were two questions I, I, I couldn't answer. You know, and so I began to think, actually, why am I engaged in this activity of endlessly spinning material um, to create a work, an original work? So it comes back maybe to this idea of what originality is to a certain degree. Um, and I began to think that the originality was actually in the methodology, not in the actual materials themselves. So the way the materials are organized and the way that materials are worked with rather than the actual materials. Um, which is not to say that it's not possible to be um, uh, to have notions of originality within the creation of musical material, because with the transformation of instrumental sounds and so on, I think it really is. Um, but it's only one aspect of that. So yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the things I do, a bit like the piece about the refrigerator, are, are, are very serious but also utterly absurd. I think that's how I, you know, if something makes me laugh, then I'll, I'll do it for longer. <laughs> um, Andrew. Yeah, I think, well, kind of picking up on this notion of uh, the composer is something we were talking about earlier. It, so in my research, I looked at audiences and what the audience thinks of a piece. And in that, I started to question, you know, well, I was trying to discover kind of what, you know, if I as a composer think that something works, how, does, how do I know that anyone else thinks that? And is that a problem or is there something positive about that? And I think actually, I wonder actually, um, in all our discussions today, whether we have focused a lot on these poetic creative processes. Whereas at the end of the day, what we're doing when we're handing it over to whoever it is, our peers or the ref panel or whatever, we're handing it to an audience. They're a type of audience. And so I wonder whether considering the audience and kind of escaping from this notion of the work as some kind of absolute thing, where it, is, is kind of beneficial because actually the work is always perceived. So I don't know how that might change the way we think about practice in this context. Yeah, um, I'm not sure I can answer that, but <laughs> I've got a couple of quick thoughts. I mean, one is that um, one of my general experiences, co very common experiences as a, as a composer in an audience, in that traditional sense of having an ensemble performing a work and sitting listening to that, was that I felt terribly bored. And I didn't enjoy it. I just felt, you know, I, I don't want to be here. I don't want to listen to this work. I know what's going to happen next. I don't particularly like what's going to happen next. Um, and so because of that, I decided what I needed to do in that situation was involve myself in the performance. Because then I was engaged in an activity which was, you know, a sound making activity alongside the other kind of sound makers or performers, um, which would help me to escape from that. And also help me to escape from the idea that, you know, just because I am feeling bored, does not mean the person next to me is feeling bored. And I think that, you know, it's a sort of very facile point maybe, but uh, one, of the, one of the issues I sometimes have when working with performers on the kind of material I'm working with is they think the audience are going to be bored. So they, they think, if I play this A natural 78 times in a row, the audience are going to be really bored. But I, I don't think we can make that supposition. You know, someone in the audience may just been waiting for that moment of hearing an A natural play 78 <laughs> times in a row. You know, and I, I think that's not where the interest necessarily is. I think there's an idea that as, as performers or as composers for performers, we are <coughs> either entertaining, um, and, and in the broadest sense of entertaining, kind of intellectually stimulating a, a, you know, an audience or whatever it might be. Um, but actually, I, you know, I, I found kind of quite early on that I didn't think that was something that I could control. But what I could control is trying to be an expert in the methodologies I was using to generate material, um, so that if someone were interested or intrigued by what was happening in the material, it would be worth um, investigating further. I'm not sure. Yeah. So we have, we have Tim and then we'll yeah. um, I'm glad uh, Paul mentioned the absurd because um, there's something quite exciting about that, and uh, arguably. It's about imagination or inspire something happening. So Perrick mm -hmm. wanted to have that uh, potential of opportunities which came out of this listening and observing and generating something. Mm -hmm. And um, it seems like there's something very vital and creative about that. Uh, but I wonder how it actually fits into a research, a sort of logical sense of it being placed within a research context. 
because there's something like opposite to that formality in that process. How are, the re how are they reconciled? Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I think um, certainly what I try to so I teach uh, teach undergraduate composition as well as you know around postgraduate uh, students. And the one thing I try to instill in the undergraduate composers is that they must ask the question, what if? And they must always be asking, you know, not instead of, th instead of thinking, um, how can I complete this composition? They need to ask the question, what if I didn't complete this composition? What if it lasted for three days? What if, you know, there were no sounds in the composition? And I think it's that kind of creative in, in, um, imperative, really, that um, we need to address as practitioners. Uh, I think that often the, the most exciting work arises from um, maybe perhaps from those questions. Um, I don't know, I think that early on my experience with the AHRC was that what they were interested in, for example, was in methodological innovation as opposed to innovation on the surface of a work or innovation regarding the kind of perceived content of a work. Um, and so my assumption was, maybe wrongly, that therefore, um, I, if I was going to get funding from the HRC or from other bodies of that nature, um, and actually, if I was going to really investigate my field, it was all about the methodologies, and I felt that the best way of exploring those was not necessarily through the kind of the, the well-travelled paths of post-serialism or post-minimalism or whatever those kind of ways of working the material might be but actually through applying what my interests were in other fields, in literature, um, and in dance, or on and so on, um, to that practice. Yeah, yeah um, what I was going to, I suppose it was an observation really, and it would um, go back to what you were saying um, about how does it tie in with research. And I played just a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, <laughs> exhausted by plays. Uh, and I think it, it, what is interesting is, as a musician, it takes you somewhere you wouldn't necessarily have chosen to go. So straight away, if you like, as a performer, you become aware of something else. This question of who wants to hear, I don't remember how many you said, 64A flats or something. Well, you wouldn't necessarily put that to the test. <laughs> Not as such. <clears throat> but once you're playing a piece like that, and again, going back to performers who are afraid, who anticipate how the audience might react. So they never find out. So they've learned, in a way, nothing at that point. But if you go there, and, and again, Jan's observation about it being a bit scientific, it's not at all. You become engaged in the process. It's, and something new happens, if it, you know. And, I think sometimes that that maybe is what's missed in this idea of um, practice not being research, that you do go somewhere new, and you do go somewhere, I mean that's, that's what's so hard as a performer, is trying to find somewhere new to go, because you're trapped by your history in many ways. Yeah. Um, but that's impact. Yes, and that's new knowledge. Well, that's what I've got. I've, I was looking at your little uh, your list, uh, your your second research step. You know, knowledge, understanding, insights, application, and that's uh, it's an interesting problem. I I think with musicians and composers that I, in my experience, far too many musicians are not willing to fully enter the world that they're asked to go into. Mm. Yeah. What does but, that link to? the comment about, you know, failure. Yes, it does, very much. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it does. Scientists and, and mixing this yeah, together. Yeah. And this, this idea, that, as you said, that we're not allowed to mention failure. I, I, I structured my PH, my first draft of my PhD on the failures, and I was told I had to get rid of it. <laughs> it was negative. All of the most important things I've learned about composition have been learned through failure. That's how, yes. I'm reminded, if you've seen Blade Runner, the guy who designed the androids, the, the actual designer, what's his name, J.R. or something, anyway. The, 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 um, the, 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 the automaton that keeps walking into the door frames all the time and then going on a new route, and that's what it felt like. <laughs> Even the long nose bit. Well, my, my sense is that what you're, you're describing, that failure is 
in some way the same process as finding the new thing, right? So you go out with a set of expectations and you fail at them and then you discover yes. and yes. the failure is yeah. the discovery of something new and it takes yeah, you because away. Because maybe yeah. another kind of yeah. methodology is that yeah. How else so do you find out what you don't know? Yeah. Mm. So it's not that they're not talked of but they're conceptualized in a different way, right? In a way of discovery rather than it, it is, yeah. I wonder if this might be a good time for us to move into our panel discussion. We continue this conversation, but maybe if we just break to thank Paul again for his talk.